Hello there. Welcome to the Ghana Careers and Opportunities Fair 2013, taking place today at Riverbank Park Plaza. Have an exciting opportunity to talk to the industry leaders. I believe this is the first ever Ghana fair, career fair to be held here in London and I would like to take this opportunity to launch the organizers for this great initiative. Having to come to the UK is one way of creating that opportunity for all of you to be employed back at home. I lived, studied, and worked in the United Kingdom, and I'm ever so grateful for the, that opportunity. There are people here, here today who probably are even better equipped than I was when I left this country. It was passion that drove me to go back to Ghana. We have a full program pack for you this afternoon. By the time we finish this event, you'd have known what you need to do to invest in Ghana or start a career in Ghana. Madam Moderator, esteemed panel of speakers, captains of the corporate sector, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It gives me great pleasure to bring you warm greetings from His Excellency, Mr. John Ramani Mahama, our dear President of our dear Republic, Ghana. On behalf of the Ghana High Commission, and on my own behalf, I'm pleased to add my voice in welcoming you all to this very, very important conference being organized also under the auspices of your own High Commission. I believe this is the first ever Ghana fair, career fair to be held here in London, and I would like to take this opportunity to laud the organizers for this great initiative. I recall that almost a year ago, on 20th July 2012, the Network for Diaspora Professionals Limited successfully organized the first Ghanaian Diaspora Professionals Networking Forum, which provided a good platform for sharing first-hand information about business opportunities and how to do business in our great country. The Guba Awards, championed by Busybody Dental, which has been going on for some time, also provides a unique platform for recognizing the spirit of Ghanaian and African entrepreneurship. I am pleased to note that the people behind these two initiatives have joined hands to share their expertise and experiences in organizing this very important event. Ladies and gentlemen, in view of the current volatile job market in which we find ourselves, and an economy that is slow, slowly recovering from recession, I believe that this career fair provides the most appropriate forum 
for interaction between job seekers and employers and for promoting job opportunities. Before I conclude, I would like to pay tribute to our distinguished panel of speakers and prospective employers who have taken time off, some traveling all the way from Ghana to participate in this forum. Our brother uh, Roland, our dear brother Dr. Ankara, and Roland, we thank you for the good work you're doing, providing water to areas of Ghana that have been deprived of water for some time. Notwithstanding the politics associated with boreholes, you've done a very great job, and Ghana owes you quite a bit. Let me also congratulate Mr. Frank Anderson, the godfather, and the time, and a few of our brothers and sisters who are making this very event successful. Those individuals who, over the years, have contributed to progress in Ghana. If there are any other ideas, any other events you think we need to hold to provide the necessary job opportunities for our people, please, the doors of the Ghana High Commission, all High Commission, are always open. Let us go. So, again, my brothers and sisters, let's continue to lift high the flag of Ghana, and let's also hope that the good Lord will continue to bless our homeland, Ghana, and continue to make our nation great and strong. Thank you so much, and I wish you very successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Your Excellency, for that introduction. So without any further ado, we'll move on to our first speaker for the panel discussion. And it is Mr. Roland Agambure, who is the Group Chairman for RLG Communications. He's going to be giving a presentation on Ghana's technological services industry. As we all know, there's several industries which are expanding across the continent, particularly in Ghana. Telecommunications is one of the major ones. But I'd like you to put your hands together to welcome Mr. Roland. Thank you. Good morning, Professor Kweku Dansubuafo. Ghana High Commissioner, the United Kingdom, fellow entrepreneurs, friends of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for giving RLG the opportunity to be part of this ceremony today. One of the critical things that you can do to succeed in Africa is not just about having a vision, the vision must travel through human beings. And I see human capital as the backbone of every successful story about every entrepreneur. So for me, the emphasis for job creation has been with me the exception of creating um, a platform to see a lot more young people like myself engage themselves into positive things having the positive energy to move on than creating the negative energy that is associated with us back at home. I know nobody wakes up here in the morning and expect to get breakfast from anybody. You have to contribute it from yourself, and that means you must find a job for yourself. But for the social contract that we have in Africa, you can walk to somebody's house and actually find breakfast for yourself. So, what have you learned? You've learned to be disciplined. You've learned to have a new law that is not social contract, but a real contract that is driven by performance. How do I change that reaction? How do I get that kind of marriage so that the social contract that is associated to the job creation that we create with the mindset of creating wealth is diffused with this kind of lessons that you've learned from United Kingdom. And that is the main reason why we're here today. Um, clearly, RLG will always seek to do what is right. But you cannot do what is right when you don't have the tools. And the tools are the human beings that are found who have learned the right way to do things. And in order to accelerate growth, we have to begin to learn from what we have learned from the best. And the best is what we have witnessed here. We are far in terms of development, the difference, the gap between 
our part of the world and the gap within here is like 200 to 300 years back, which means there is a huge gap. Industrial deficit, infrastructure deficit, everything. So if you are able to find yourself in this space and you are able to create an opportunity for yourself, it is easy for you to create an opportunity back at home for others. So for us, um, we decided to associate ourselves to be able to attract the right people and the right labor and be able to create our own story. Because if you look at Africa, there's nothing that is lacking in Africa. Everything is there. All, of, all that we see, we part ourselves with natural resources. But what do you do with the natural resources? Every natural resource is exported. At the end, it is much exported back to you, more expensive than you can think about. I have always said that one of the key things our politicians can do for entrepreneurs is to deliberately allow entrepreneurs to function and the void of politics in helping to pull down their same entrepreneurs. But yet, they part and then glorify other entrepreneurs in the other part of the world. They didn't do that to their entrepreneurs. What they do is they create them. They don't destroy them because there cannot be a political environment. Who are you going to rule? Resources and human beings. Who create the resources? Politicians don't create resources. Entrepreneurs create resources. And the people who work with the resources are the people who live in the country. And the people who live in the country will dwell on wealth. And when there's wealth, there's no agitation because it's well distributed and everybody is happy. That means there should be more encouragement for wealth creation, and that is entrepreneurship, but not the opposite of bemoaning wealth and in another regard, pretending to be creating wealth. It is it's if, uh, one of the most hypocritic way to create entrepreneurs. I think that one of the energies that we should put ourselves into is to live here with that mindset. And for those who are going to be screened through this program for RLG, we would always set the pace. We think that having to come to the UK is one way of creating that opportunity for all of you to be employed back at home and to change the mindset of people. I am not sure, but I can say this might be the first of its kind that a Ghanaian company is traveling across looking for human resource back to be able to create jobs for people. We're not just looking at Ghana or Africa as a whole, we're also looking at the world because Africa have a role to play in the world. The world is a place for everybody. It is not for us to sit down and think that when you are in Africa, you are the, you are the minor and therefore you should aspire to look at the top. We should always aspire because if you look at the resources that is in Africa, you can create a lot more value for yourself and the world will always come to Africa for everything. That means you deserve to be at the top, but you have refused to take that opportunity to be at the top. We want to change the, the ideology of that. We started with an ICT company knowing that the perception is that you cannot do anything like a mobile phone, no matter how it is, even in our own country. 10 years ago, nobody believed it. But today, it's a reality. That means whatever you believe in, it is a possibility. We think that Ghana has a strategic location, being at the middle of the world. The Greenwich Meridian passes through Tema. That tells you that you can arrive anywhere in the world within seven to eight hours, which gives you a unique opportunity to be the forefront of everything in the world, in terms of tourism, in terms of economics, and everything, transportation. So clearly, once you have this unique opportunity with all the natural resources, what stops you from ruling the world? The only thing that can drive that force is the human beings. The only thing that can change that is ICT. ICT rules the world today. 
all of us here cannot do without our mobile phones, we cannot do without our computers, we cannot do without ICT. And even the mic I'm using now is powered by ICT. Hence, for us, we think that we want to charter that course so that a lot of things can change. But you will be the ones to do that. For me, it's a matter of a vision. It's a matter of a dream. But the reality lies on the people who are going to carry that dream and manage with that dream. I want to thank uh, Denta and her team, Frank, for at least um, taking steps to listen and accept the idea of us creating this job fair. The aim of RLG last year, I set a task that for me, one of the things that one want to do is to create one million jobs across Africa within the next five years. It may sound ambitious, but it's a possibility. This year, um, one of the ambitious projects that Hope City is supposed to create is a $10 billion Hope City in Ghana. Yes, it sounds ambitious, but it's a reality. Everything that sounds ambitious in the world becomes a reality if you believe in it. Where we are today, it was an idea and an agenda, a vision, married by somebody that you want to create a brand. Say that if you are traveling from any part of the world and you say you are coming to the United Kingdom, there is a certain brand and perception that carries you there. But you wake up and say you are going to Ghana, there is a certain perception and a brand. It means you are going to poverty when you are going to Ghana. But when you are coming to UK, the mindset is you are coming to the world of wealth. How do you create that perception in a reverse for yourself? You must start somewhere. We are already late. One of the things I have been saying of late is that it is like the lion and the gazelle story. When they break in Africa, the gazelle runs very fast to overtake the lion, or else the lion will eat the gazelle. And the lion is running faster to catch up with the gazelle, or else the lion will starve. Whichever way, whether you are a lion or you are a gazelle, you have to run fast. We are late already. And looking at what I'm telling you, it means if you are putting 10 hours in working in the UK, if you get opportunity to be in Ghana to work, you have to put 20 hours because you are already late. I will not take too much time in talking because what I would want to do is to hear from you and if there are any questions in your mind, you can ask and I'll explain further. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much for that, Roland. Um, and indeed, creating opportunities in Ghana, across Africa, is, is very key. And I think that's why you're all here today, to see what opportunities there are. And there is a careers fair which is going to be taking place at the end of this session, so you can meet with all the potential companies, organisations that may have opportunities. So again, a congratulations to both Frank and Denta for organising this is the very first of these events, and it's an honour to be here. I will move along to our next speaker this morning, which is Dr. Mark Ankara. And Dr. Mark Ankara is with us today as the investment, um, sorry, as the director for the state housing company, and will be giving a presentation on investment opportunities. Your Excellency, housing happens to be one of the disciplines like football, we have 24 million people in Ghana who think they know one or two things about housing. And uh, surprisingly, the state of housing in Ghana is no secret. We shouldn't kid ourselves. Where there are problems and challenges, we should also see the opportunities to create jobs. And the key word for me today is the word opportunity. We may or may not know but the official figures point to the fact that we need about 1.7 million uh, properties <coughs> or housing units in Ghana. That's a fact. I can also tell you from experience that unofficially, this figure can easily be doubled. The situation in Ghana and for that matter in Africa 
calls for a more careful look at these situations. Otherwise, we'll be pouring water into baskets. This is the reality. For me, my passion stems from the fact that, like most of you here, I lived, studied, and worked in the United Kingdom. And I'm ever so grateful for the, that opportunity. There are people here, here today who probably are even better equipped than I was when I left this country. It was passion that drove me to go back to Ghana. Until we learn to take advantage of the opportunities that look at us, both in the UK and in Ghana, we will forever be chasing our tails because we must start looking at ourselves. We can create jobs, and housing is one such environment where the opportunities are enormous. To start with, we are looking for investment. Investments do something that I will humbly submit, that no credible investor will invest into anything they don't understand. They have to understand. For them to understand that investment and put in their money, they need information. Once they have the information, they need to trust that information and use it. And then the final thing they do is to decide whether they are confident enough to take that giant step. When you go to Ghana and you say real estate, it means everything and everything. Everybody is doing whatever they like. But I can assure you, in the last 20 to 30 years, it is not by accident that housing, delivery, and provision in Ghana has been dwindling. It is not by accident. Housing is a process. And there are so many activities that happen before you actually get to construct the house. And there are so many things that happen post-construction. The good thing is that for most of you here, you are in the industry. And there is a, new, a huge knowledge gap in Ghana, which accounts, among many things, to where we are right now in terms of the deficit. The situation, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing to write home about. And I believe that until we have people who understand the subject of housing, who have the expertise and the knowledge, and are prepared to come in and look at the opportunities that exist by way of the supply side as well as the demand side, we will be struggling for a very long time. As far as Africa is concerned, if we don't get social housing and regeneration into perspective, we'll be wasting our time for a very long time. Just before I came over this morning, uh, out there, I was interacting with a young man who will be speaking, I'm sure, this afternoon. And the opportunities that we have right now going forward, even when you look at just housing finance. And let me say to you, one of the reasons why over the past 20 years we have called, it started from one million housing deficit. We went for about 10 years, and every year we quoted one million housing deficit. Up to now, it's because even housing finance is an issue. But opportunities are there. Apart from the vision of the president, we have a new pensions act, we are now looking at the uh, real estate investment trust vehicle. On the negative side of things, we don't have a specialist construction bank in Ghana. And you cannot do housing without the supply side. Some of the banks, their property portfolios are the worst performing portfolios. And so they won't touch it at all. If you look at the size of Ghana Commercial Bank, at one point they were doing so well with the property market, now they don't want to touch it. We are, we are looking at the mortgage market. The, the mortgage market, the opportunities there are enormous. When you look at this, the case of the state housing company, I, I was appointed in 2010. The company had been on the divestiture list for over 15 years, and nobody would touch it with a badge pole because it was making losses all over the place. And this is a company that has the last, largest housing stock in Ghana. Over 32,000 across the country, we have investment interest in all these properties. It was badly managed, it lacked vision. As a lead implementer of housing in the public sector, it was actually, it's being made a member of the Ghana Real Estate Association and was sitting somewhere waiting to die. Today, we have embarked on a social housing vision, regeneration, and sustainable neighborhood strategies. The opportunities are enormous. We're going to 
start our, in fact, we've started our programs, the Carnation Regeneration Program started, we are in court. And one of the reasons why I believe that for some of you, you don't need to be looking to be employed, is that the opportunities in Ghana right now lends itself to people with the knowledge and the know-how, the exposure, because there are a breed of people back home. And, you know, God bless them. We have talented people there who are good. But I still believe that we must learn from the Israeli experience. We must tap into our diaspora expertise. Because without that, we are going to have people, unfortunately, for most of them, who are not exposed. As uh, Roland rightly said, we have the benefit of exposure in this part of the world, whether we like it or not have taken advantage and dominated the environment, and we can only learn from them. So it's very important for all of us to do a self-introspection and find out, do I really need a job, or do I need to go back home and make the right contacts and see what advantages there are, what opportunities there are in housing finance, in construction, in development, in management, in related services, I will end by pointing you to the GIPC website. Under finance, it all applies to housing. Opportunities in, uh, opportunities in mortgage, insurance, you name it. All these things are there. Please, I want to leave here knowing that people are doing the self-introspection that I talked about, that for the majority of you, you can actually be employers and not employees. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you very much indeed for that very enlightening presentation and the prospects of 1.7 million houses being needed. They clearly have to be built by someone and somebody and a group of people with the know-how, as you said. And I hope that many of you will find yourselves in the careers fair after this session and explore some of these possibilities and opportunities. We are going to open up to the panel uh, questions now from yourselves. Hi, my name is Prince Balfour, CFO of Vox Africa. Uh, my question is to Roland. I think you're doing a great job. I just want to know, with you going global, what are your key competitors and what kind of strategies would you use? I mean, if you could say it, in order to be ahead of the market. Thank you. Um, Dr. Charlie, you've found it all very inspirational. Just one question and suggestion, whether we're going to have any uh, business masterclasses from some of the uh, attendees and um, whether we can have opportunities to hear from people who've tried to do the investment that some of you talked to so we can get the real-life stories of uh, problems and uh, benefits. So the first two questions were directed uh, to Roland. So the challenges and what are your key competitors? Clearly, I can tell you there are no challenges. <laughs> challenges are opportunities. <laughs> so there are no challenges. With Hope City, the challenge is in your own mind. If you begin to think that there are challenges, you will not succeed. And that is where I started from. Hope City is a huge opportunity for Africa to transform. All the natural resources, we want to change the land space and research and development, a city that is going to house people like you who will never look out in other parts of the world but spend all your money in that city, begin to create wealth within, and a city that is going to have a lifestyle for everybody, young people, old people, and begin to create tourism and attraction for people in Africa, not to be thinking about traveling elsewhere to have a holiday, but to find themselves in that city. Where can you find challenges in that? Today's world, competition represents opportunity. What competition does is, you don't uh, compete, but you work together to succeed in the market. And in terms of strengthening your self around, you look at your weaknesses and look at your opponent's strength, and together, where you have your weaknesses, your opponent has some weaknesses as well. So you look at those two areas and make your swap analysis and begin to work towards those weaknesses and then strengthen yourself in the market. Our hallmark is to be the best in the mobile phone space and to create an African um, thing 
if you look at Africa, one of the things you cannot find is what is what is the kind of brand that you can really associate yourself. Yes, there are a lot of organizations, there are a lot of things that people talk about, but there's nothing clearly that you can say this is an African brand. You cannot find that African brand because you need to create our own African thing that has its own apps, its own solutions, its own techniques that gives the African um, a solution so that others who want to begin to participate and believe in that culture. You cannot uh, take a culture and transfer it into somebody's culture. What you can do, you can practice the best and take what is good for yourself. So RLG is creating an African brand and that is going to give us the edge to be able to move ahead of our competitors. We don't want to just do what is the standard by being just having a phone to talk and then send text or just Facebook. No, but as we speak to you now, our focus is on creating solutions for the African, and that is where the brand is. Talking about the mobile phone world, Africa has the highest density of mobile phone subscribers today. So that is a huge market already, but where is the brand that people can relate and say, this is an African brand? You mentioned the Samsung, you know where it's coming from. Mention Nokia, you know where it's coming from. Mention Toyota, you know where it's coming from. Mensing Ford, you know where it's coming from. This is what Arabi wants to do. Thank you. Um, and if you'd like to mention very brief, briefly about the business masterclasses, would you be doing it? Yes, certainly. Uh, Frank and I spoke early part of this year when I visited briefly, and the number of people who queued at the hotel wanting to see me was overwhelming. So I think if you speak to Frank, he will organize it and uh, I promise I'll make myself available. I do appreciate and understand that this is certainly not a platform to provide in-depth information that will give people the confidence they need to make that bold step. So I can assure you, Doc, um, that will be in the pipeline. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's quite interesting that we made the mention about challenges because I discovered recently that in Chinese language, there's two symbols that make up the word challenge, is threat and opportunity. So it may point a finger to a reason why there's so many Chinese in Africa at the moment, but I think it's a, a vision that we can all uh, look to. I want to actually ask you a question, Your Excellency. I mean, we say that Ghana is amongst the 10 fastest growing economies in the world right now. Ghana has over 8% growth expected for 2013, but yet around 70% of the continent is still unemployed. What is Ghana doing, or how can Ghana work towards distributing this so-called wealth? We have human capital resource, we have minerals, we have um, many, many uh, natural resources. So how can we work collectively, or what is being done to ensure that we are employing not just the diaspora, but also those on the continent, those in Ghana? Thank you so much. Uh, uh, government has come up with several strategies for creating employment, especially for the youth, because you know a larger majority of Ghanaian population is the youth, and therefore we need to address the youth employment. There are strategies to get the educational institutions to uh, synchronize the kinds of curriculum they offer to job opportunities in the country. I think in my introductory remarks, I also made reference to other programs that government, government has been ro uh, rolling up. Uh, areas in uh, youth employment, the uh, GDA uh, program, uh, the LEAP program, uh, apprenticeship uh, training programs that the government has initiated and other areas that various ministries, you know, recently all the ministries, ministers were requested to provide their uh, strategies for creating employment in the country. And we believe that within the next four years, we would want to see a translation of our GDP growth, our economic growth, into job creation. That is the number one priority of government. IOM in general, it's an intergovernmental organization. We've been working for many years with African governments, and the whole idea is migration for development, is to help diaspora people to return to their countries, to help in their development. So it's, as I said, it's wonderful to see how this um, forum is providing opportunities. Hey, I'm Michael Lemanning from Invest in Africa. I came to the Careers Fair today. Um, I thought it was a very good event. I thought that um, 
it's good to see young Ghanaians very excited about going back to Ghana, making a difference. Um, we've got a really well-educated diaspora, and it's time to go back and make a difference. You know, there's a lot of challenges that need to be faced. We can only do it by doing it together, both private sector and government. So it was a very good event. What did you think? Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, I mean, I definitely thought um, it was very uh, uh, inspirational for us a lot as, uh, as Africans that actually want to come back. You know, we're, looking, we're kind of like knocking on the door right now, really, just waiting for it to open. And um, what people were saying, the, uh, the speakers, they really gave a lot of inspiration to me and my friends also. And uh, it's really just a catalyst now uh, for hopefully to make me go back as well as others go back and uh, do something for ourselves and for our country. I believe with this kind of programs, it gives us the hope that we can come back home and be part of the system part of the um, you know the growing economy in Ghana so that we can all make Ghana a better place. The event was great, I loved it, I enjoyed it, made lots of people, made lots of new friends, um, networked. Um, I'll definitely be the, the one the next one in Ghana, Accra, which I believe is next year sometime. Thank you. Ghana we all know is seen to be one of the fastest growing um, economies in the world, not just Africa. Ghana's banking sector has 26 banks. The sector has seen so many changes over the last few years that has strengthened the sector. And you notice that when there was a general financial crisis in the world, the banks in Ghana did not suffer because we are actually not too adventurous. And also, <laughs> it provides room for a lot of opportunity as well because now, those who survived and because of the new regulations that have strengthened the banks, we're now able to cautiously go into products that would actually help grow the economy. We have banking, we have insurance, and then one big area that's really growing is the non-bank financial services area. Um, at UT, we like to think that we have fueled the growth in this area because we did so well that everybody looked at it and said, well, this is doable, so we're going to do it. We have over 60 non-bank financial services companies in Ghana now. Um, it's regulated by Bank of Ghana, and it is seriously regulated by Bank of Ghana. So those of you who are looking to put your monies back home, you should know that the supervision is very tough, and so your monies are safe. And there are lots of investment opportunities, I'm sure um, Eric will be talking to you about that, in Ghana. And your money is safe with banks in Ghana. We have, as I said, 26 banks. This has grown from 16 in 2000. Unfortunately, most of the new banks in Ghana are foreign banks. 51% of the banks in Ghana are foreign banks. We have um, about 14 banks that are foreign. We have about six domestic banks. and another six or so government-owned banks. The competition in the banking sector has, is also very tough, which is another good thing for consumers and those who want to join the banking sector because it means that we're becoming more professional, we're giving um, better products, um, we're serving our customers more, better. The new buzz is now relationship banking, and if you don't know how to do it, you're dead. And we've seen income market share move from the big banks that we thought nobody could touch to the smaller banks. There's a high quest for innovation. We have more sophisticated consumers. Um, they demand innovation, they demand service, and you have to step up to the plate. So you'll find banking services starting to get close to what you'll find in the Western world, which is really really good and it's key and it's measured in so many ways we have banking awards we have all sorts of um, customer service awards that we all in the banking industry look out for and we want our names to be uh, associated with these awards so we are working hard towards that there is money in there and we've seen it in the asset growth and credit credit expansions it's also been obviously fueled by sustainable economic development and growth and the political climate that we've had in Ghana. And the regulatory, <coughs> regulatory environment, I have to keep on emphasizing that the regulatory environment is really, really strong and it's working for us as an economy. 
And I think it's also another reason why the banks are doing so well and, and they're growing. Now, technology in banking is, is replacing human capital. Not quite, it's just, it's replacing it in, in the balance of what is more important. We are doing, we're providing banking services online. So internet banking, phone banking is very big and um, it help, to help care fraud and stuff like that, every bank has SMS alerts, you have your internet banking alerts, you have your internet statements, email alerts, so that you know what's happening in your account almost every day. Um, we are all trying to move from using PayPal in the banking halls to doing everything directly on, on, the, on our systems. So software development, um, software maintenance, management, those skills are, are in such high demand. Uh, if you, those of you who are programmers and you want to try your hand at these things, there are companies that need you in Ghana. Now one of the key things that all of this, that's happening in the banking sector is doing for Ghana's economy is that it is supporting SME growth. SME creativity, entrepreneurship, and SME development. Um, all, all the banks are trying to support small businesses and SMEs so that they can grow to, to, to feed the banks. I mean, we need them, we need these businesses to be big so that we can survive as banks. And one of the other key things is the pension sector expansion. Uh, those of you who know what's happening on the pension uh, sphere, it's been. The administration of pension money have, has changed. We now have tier one, tier two, tier three, and SNIT is only um, managing tier one. Which means that banks now have the opportunity to provide products for long-term investment for pension funds. And um, this is something that is key because we need funding for the construct construction <coughs> industry and you can only do that with long-term funds. And that is lacking in Ghana. We just don't have, we don't even have medium-term funds. There's, there's no way to find, you know, five-year money, 10-year money, unless you go outside Ghana. So the Pension Act is a very good opportunity for the financial services sector. Now, what does this all mean for you, for those of you who want to come to Ghana? You can see from all the things that I'm saying that the opportunities in the banking sector are huge. When people talk about opportunities in the banking sector, the only thinking about bankers, as in those who will do uh, relationship management, the customer service, the banking hall executives. But we need people in the background. We need IT professionals. Um, and for, for the banks in Ghana, we even need people who are experts in the property area because we use these to secure our loans. So if you want to be sure, you're doing a big construct, doing project man management for a construct, construction firm, you're going to need um, experts in the construction industry. So um, this gentleman here, Frank, I think you should not just talk to the prof uh, property companies, but you should talk to the banks as well. And I'd like to talk to you after this. But we, 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 you need, people in various, various, various parts of the business. If you think about it, we're growing with the companies, so HR executives are, are required, not just bankers. You need, um, um, we even need catering companies. We provide lunch for our staff. We have 1,400 people easily in that company, and we provide lunch every day. We work with about six catering companies at any given time and we like to rotate them every six months or so, so that's opportunity. And I know that there are lots of Ghanaians here who are really good at that, but in Ghana, they don't see it as a, a big industry. It is a big industry in Ghana. We're looking for customer experience, uh, customer service leaders. We all know that our customer service in Ghana is poor. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> <they're not laughs> But with, with, <laughs> and, and with the demands that our customers want from us in our banking halls, in our um, relationships with them, we need people to teach us in Ghana what customer service really means. And the more, we have some 
but we don't have enough. The more of you who come to Ghana and demand proper customer service, the better it is for, for the industry to so that we can achieve. But it is specifically, particularly important for the um, financial services sector because everything now is about relationship management. And frankly, we don't understand relationship management. We need people who would come, who have the compliance skills to monitor, to teach, to enforce compliance because the repercussions for when you break them are, are quite dire. Um, we need underwriters. It's one thing that's missing in the insurance industry <coughs> is experienced underwriters. We just don't have them. Most of the underwriters we have in Ghana uh, belong to foreign companies and we actually go outside Ghana to get the underwriters. There's only one real uh, underwriting company in Ghana that's Ghana real. And there are one or two, I think the last time we checked, there were probably only about four qualified working within Ghana. So there are people that need to come in. We have a, a growing oil industry that's run by foreigners. That's good, but we need to learn the skills. So we can't leave it like that for a long time. We, we, we have to see some sort of balance between um, the foreign skills that are coming in and the skills that Ghanaians are learning and also um, I'm using in the industry. And it is important for the financial services sector because we are funding these projects. We're doing so many um, trade deals, um, LCs, guarantees, projects, and we don't have a clue what the industry needs or what to look out for. And we also need to understand the industry so that we can support the entrepreneurs and the businesses that have to grow around these industries to grow for Ghana's economy to be even stronger. <laughs> Risk-oriented stuff. Um, risk management, probably about five, six years ago, was not huge in Ghana. Now, even the non-banks, small non-banks, need risk, um, and, and management, risk management skills. So those of you who've worked in the banking industry, financial services industry, in, in the UK and want to come back home, we do need skills like that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, our next uh, speaker is Eric Vincent Boucher. Uh, he has a wealth of experience. In, uh, I think this session we're talking financial services, isn't it? Between 1990 and 1996, he worked at the World Bank. Uh, but he currently um, is a chairman and chief executive of Gravitas Capital Advisors. It's an asset uh, management firm. So, so all of you who are into asset management, he is, is the guy to talk to. But uh, in particular, he wants to speak about the home strength experience. Home strength is an amazing concept. The key challenge is what uh, uh, Emily talked about, and that is the paucity or the absence of instruments that give you access. So he mentioned the difference between Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, and some of the others in terms of the sophistication of the market, in terms of the instruments that are available. One of the benefits uh, that Homestrings uh, enjoys is that it is its parent company, Gravitas Capital, which is a, a, an asset management uh, company. That company uh, has uh, the expertise to develop new products. And so we are actively working with uh, partners uh, in Ghana, in Nigeria, and in Kenya to build new financial products, new financing products that give the diaspora access to investments in power, in infrastructure, in real estate. Uh, but at the same time, allows the project sponsors to aggregate investments from the diaspora into these, uh, these, uh, these projects. And those instruments will be listed domestically the local stock market, the local bond market, as well as international, so in the Ames market here and in Mauritius. And, uh, and so we've been working very, very, uh, very, very hard uh, on, uh, on that. Some of the projects that we're really excited about in Ghana, um, and I think Roland talked about uh, Hope City, there are a couple of other projects that are similar to that that, are, that we think are transformative, and it has to do with urbanization. One of the things that we've seen, uh, I think somewhat in Ghana, certainly in Kenya as well, is the, the political devolution, i.e. where 
um, decisions, uh, internal decisions, or American move to newly created municipalities. So in the case of, of, uh, of Kenya, they've created the governorship of, uh, uh, of Nairobi, which is 60% of the GDP. You see some of the, of the same thing happening in Ghana with the creation of these new cities. So Apollonia City, King City, where the chiefs of those cities are negotiating directly with the investment banks on the financing of the transformation of the urban transformation of these cities. And so we're working very closely with uh, Renaissance Capital, which is one of the uh, entities that is working closely with these two cities, to develop financing instruments that will be listed on home streams available to the diaspora to finance roads, finance commercial real estate, finance uh, services as well. Uh, and we're very, very excited by, uh, um, uh, by those, uh, those elements. I want to quickly shift to, I guess, you know, the main issue in terms of uh, skills. Um, I happen to also be involved with a uh, uh, careers counseling business here that facilitates the transfer of uh, executives, African executives, into companies uh, back, uh, back home. One of the major issues, one of several major issues that we have heard is that when a company comes to hire a, a Ghanaian to work in Ghana, the, the package, the compensation package, the compensation package that's offered to the Ghanaian is very different than the compensation package that's offered to a UK national who is asked to vote, move to a different environment. And we think that if the skill sets are the same, the compensation should be the same. In fact, we've seen that happening in Nigeria. So one project we fund investing in clinics and in hospitals was able to negotiate the transfer of a general manager of a major hospital in the UK to be the general manager of the clinics in Nigeria, giving him the same compensation package. He was able to uproot his entire family and his kids, have replicated his, um, his pension, replicated his health insurance, replicated the education for his children and his residence back into Abuja. And therefore that transition uh, was made very, very easy. And so I think it's important uh, that the companies who are looking to hire, they make sure that they're not discounting the compensation back simply because you're from uh, home doesn't mean that you, your labor is, is cheap, unless you're going to go work for the government as, uh, as the doctor said, you know, the <laughs> In that case, you, as you said, you're doing it for patriotism for uh, reasons. I think Ghana is at the forefront of homegrown solutions, and I, and I think that that need not be lost, whether it's in creating financial instruments, whether it's in creating home-built uh, skills, whether it's in facilitating the transfer of the diaspora back, uh, back home. As part of the culture, homegrown solutions has been the, the hallmark of Ghana in West Africa uh, at the very least and on a continental basis. Your equivalent on the east side of Africa is Kenya. Mm -hmm. Kenya has homegrown solutions. I mean, they recently launched a uh, real estate investment trust that has development. So you're going to be able to finance you know, uh, development products within a REIT structure. That's unique. They did PESA. That's also unique. So I think Ghana should, in fact, take hold of this. And I think the diaspora is very, very key in that, uh, in that process. So I'll, uh, I'll stop uh, there. I have a lot more to say uh, that I will Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's quite clear that <coughs> there are opportunities out there and there's a lot of demand for our skills individually and collectively. And I think we can create that critical mass that will affect the changes that are required uh, in Ghana. So uh, let's, let's uh, the floor is now open and we we'll encourage as many questions as we possibly can. How do you accommodate some of us when we come back there and try to use the experience and the exposure we have, we have here to increase shareholder value rather than branding us to more? You, you have to balance it. Um, you have a lot of um, foreign Ghanaians who come back home and they feel that everything in Ghana is bad. Mm. Now, if you go into an institution and you make them feel that everything they do is not good, you will get treated that way. But if you're willing to listen, accommodate, and find a good way of 
teaching what you think is good, it will be better received. Because sometimes we don't even stop to, to learn. There is something to learn from those who are there. You have to understand what is there for you to be able to change it. But we don't try to understand, we just no, but this doesn't happen in the UK. <laughs> I've lived here before, I went back home, so I know what I'm talking about. And so it's the attitude. It's really the attitude. You have to look at how you relay the information and make sure it's important. You spoke about assisting SMEs and with um, investment to, to actually grow. Um, what are the strategies that the bank is using to actually assist them to, to grow? Supporting SMEs is a big issue or a big challenge for banks in Ghana. Most SMEs come to banks and all they want is money. And they want startup money. Most banks will not give you startup money. What we try to do is to try to encourage them, first of all, to teach them the basics of um, managing their companies. Um, it may show them where, how to find initial startup capital, support them with making sure that they're learning how to put in uh, proper corporate governance um, structures, um, manage their, how to manage their accounts, manage their people, even how to grow their business through marketing, advertising, and all of that, so that they can actually use the services available in the bank. But most people, when they talk about um, financial institutions helping SMEs, they want to start a bank, and that's difficult. But we do, we as a bank, we do a lot of um, financial literacy programs. We support a lot of institutions that are training entrepreneurs and um, uh, small businesses. We will support um, quite a lot of um, exhibitions or um, competitions to bring out good ideas that can be supported. But I think the main thing is to teach Ghanaian companies that you can put in, you, you can run the company efficiently, effectively, um, not use a lot of fraudulent means, and make money and grow. And that companies like ET Bank who've grown to become big, did not do it by juju or magic. And we did that by following proper business principles to get there. So that's the key thing. You did talk about compliance being the main drive now in, with the banks. What sort of compliance are you talking about? Are you talking about the financial side of the compliance or are you talking about the IT compliance as well? Compliance cuts across everywhere. I think when I was speaking, I said that now uh, financial services is being run on information in, on technology. So you cannot limit compliance to the actual um, form completion and um, paperwork that goes in. That paperwork gets into uh, the systems that we use. The systems that we use have to be secure, they have to be protected. We do a lot of online um, transactions. They all have to follow compliance, you know, um, regulations. And compliance in IT now is probably bigger. You have, um, even trying to do AML compliance, you need a software to be able to track the trends and, you know, because people find ways and means mm. to break transactions up so that they, they don't seem to be uh, funny. But you now need these systems to track them. And if you don't have them, you will have problems with re um, regulators. We, we have all these compliance audits from the central bank and they come in the direct system, so it's very key. And my interest is in education, languages, uh, marketing, PR, event management, but there's no other talk of banking. So my question is, is there any remit for all these other themes, other sectors I've mentioned, especially also I'm fluent in French, there's been no talk of any other languages, I'm fluent in tree, there's been no talk of languages. Um, as I said earlier, we are one company, we employ over a thousand people, we train everybody in the company at least three times a year. We train in everything from um, English, customer service, we, we train. You have to keep um, improving on whatever your staff bring into your company. PR, 
a gamut of other one, PNR. Every institution, whether it's a financial services industry, um, IT industry, whatever, they, you'll find that we are all now beginning to have PI departments. There are lots of companies that have come up who are pure PR strategy companies and they're doing very well. We need those services. So there's a lot for you again. Um, my question really be, um, is based on just on your website in Ghana to um, advertise jobs. So I guess people like yourselves who are trying to reach out to everyone here um, would like to advertise your jobs on my platform. Now, one of my question is more um, for you, Pell, in terms of how do you sort of get those jobs that you have advertised or, or, or available in your company to people around the world? We will do adverts in newspapers, um, we'll use uh, recruitment agencies, and we put quite a lot of jobs on our website as well. well thank you so, so very much. Thank you for your time, and once again, let's go away thinking what we can do. Uh, there is, uh, there's a need for credit analysts, programmers, uh, customer service for people, uh, not just going to work, but actually going to train the workforce as well. Uh, our next session in the Career Space, so I'm sure uh, some of you have interviews lined up, and uh, those of you who don't have uh, the interviews, uh, so you can network, as a change business cards, the uh, Uhuru Talent has been won already. Uh, let's show it up. <laughs> it's been won already. Uh, but once again, thank you for registering. Thank you for coming here. Uh, but we have a vote of thanks uh, from the founder of uh, Guba Awards, the partner uh, in, uh, in putting this event together. So let's welcome Denta Awadze. Thank you, Frank. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to our panelists for coming in. Um, Bloody from Ghana, Bloody from I think, America, Eric's always flying in and out. Um, but a big thank you. Google and Network for the Disport of Diaspora and Professionals um, decided to put on this event last year. After the Google Awards, we met up with Roland and he really had the vision that we should be a career fair. Um, and so we put on this event um, and the turnout has been amazing. I just want to say a big thank you um, to everybody that has come um, today. This has been an amazing fair because what it's done is that it's brought together a two of the biggest brands in Ghana and a huge constituency of Ghanaians and other Africans in the diaspora who are, who are looking to launch their career or restart their career and contribute their best uh, to Ghana. So I, I found this as an amazing, an amazing forum, really. The business uh, and investments and careers opportunities forum that we just came out of really highlighted the, uh, the, the trends within the key sectors and the projected human resource demands over the next decade. And so it has equipped the uh, participants at this fair with the requisite information as to exactly which direction uh, they should be channeling their studies and really uh, they got to understand whether or not their particular skills and talents are what is needed uh, as Ghana moves forward. So this really has been very useful and the expectation is that in 2014 when this event holds in Accra many more companies will join and even more, many more candidates would also uh, participate on this platform. So this has been really a useful experience. Thank you. Well, we have finally come to the end of today's session, Ghana Careers and Opportunities Fair. I want to say a very big thank you to our sponsors, ROG, UT Bank, Ghana Home Loans, and ThatNewJob.com. It has been an absolute pleasure working with you. I want to thank the Ghana High Commission for supporting us, Guber Awards, and all the partners that make this, this careers fair a success. We're looking forward to next year. Please visit our website, www.ganacareersfair.co.uk. Sign up to our newsletters and send us your comments and feedback. We'll see you next year at Ghana Careers Fair 2014. Have a wonderful evening.